Joining me on our third episode of Seconds Out is um, Kevin Lorena, former SNRBO cruiserweight champion, former WBA heavyweight contender, current uh, WBC interim bridgeweight title holder. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Shona. Only my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Let's get straight into it. You're a jockey that became a heavyweight <laughs> boxer. <laughs> Tell me how you did it because I've been trying to do it the reverse <laughs> my entire life. That's crazy. I wouldn't say I was a jockey, but I was an aspiring jockey. I mean, my whole family is steeped in horse racing tradition. And for me, that's what I thought I wanted to be from the age of seven years old from when I started riding horses up until 14, 15, when I went to a very good school and rugby became the thing. And I obviously realized I enjoyed rugby and then a thing called puberty hit me and I shot up. <laughs> so for me, that's where my jockey dreams kind of ended. But uh, look where we are today. It's a kind of a surreal story that very few will believe unless they really know me and the Lorena Racing family. You, you speak of rugby. Was rugby your, your passion as a child from a sports po a point of view? It was definitely a sport that I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed all sports. I played all sports at school. I played cricket. I played rugby. I did athletics. I just was never very good in the swimming pool. But <laughs> when it came to sports, soccer, cricket, athletics, but my number one sport I'd say at school was rugby. I enjoyed my rugby and I went to a very good uh, rugby school, King Edward School Cares, you know, obviously steeped in rugby tradition. And um, yeah, so I'd say at Cares, it's everything. It's academics and rugby or maybe the other way around, rugby then academics. Um, you also, you, t you took a little break from boxing at some point to try yeah. and r revive or, or start your rugby career. Talk to, talk to us about that. Yeah, I had an opportunity to go down to the shock. Sean Everett was the coach. He said, come train with the guys during the Super 14 preseason and let's see if there's a way for you to navigate into the Vodacom Cup team and perhaps maybe into the Super Rugby squad, you know, if, you, if you're if up to scratch because they obviously knew my rugby ability from school days and then being a big, strong, physical guy, they, they kind of welcomed me with open arms. But it was something that just didn't go for me. It never clicked for me or maybe it wasn't meant to click for me, but uh, it never worked out. But... I have no regrets. I have absolutely no regrets. I am where I am today because I made the right decisions then to exit the sport of rugby and focus wholeheartedly on my boxing. What position did you play? Centre, inside centre mainly. You mates with Jesse Creel, one very of the nicest friends. guys around. Eh? Yes, the top guy, phenomenal athlete, a very, very inspirational human being and a phenomenal rugby player. But more than that, he's a very good friend. Why did you never have an amateur career? You know, Sean, with boxing... I never really had a setup or an amateur setup or a place to go. So when I started boxing 100% with Peter, it was almost like the time amateur boxing wasn't really thriving in the country. You know, if you had happened to go to a weigh-in, I never got a matchup. I think I went to one or two weigh-ins and I never got a matchup, so I got despondent. I'm the type of person who gives his all to seek something in return. And I went to a weigh-in, I never got a matchup. Went to a Wayne, never got a matchup, and I was just like, you know what? You know, what's the point? And perhaps there were matchups to be made. You just had to go to the right Wayne's or be patient. But uh, I have no regrets, you know. You know, I trained hard with Peter for a good seven, eight months before he turned me pro. And I learned a lot by sparring guys like Tabiso Mchunu, Chris Van Heeren would help me, uh, Tsapang Mohale, um, Elvis Moya would assist me a little bit, to name a few, you know. Um, and I learned a lot from those guys in order to help me to pro. But obviously it was Trina, uh, Peter's tutelage and, and, and the skills that he gave me to help me survive the early part of my career without having that amateur background. Did you just walk into his gym and say, hey, I want to be pro? How did that, how did that come about? Chris Van Heeren actually brought me to the Smiths. So what happened was I was training at a gym in, in Bruma. It was like an MMA gym called Quantum Tribe. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was going to MMA classes. Then I was going to grappling classes. Then I was doing a bit of stand-up at that time. Cassius Beloy was training guys there. And Chris Van Heeren walked in and he, he saw me hitting the bag. And he said to me, do you, do you box? So I said, no, well, I kind of want to be a cage fighter. I like fighting. So he said, no, man, come meet my trainer, Peter. And uh, I'll introduce you to him and then take it from there. So I said, okay, cool. At this time, I knew who Chris Van Heeren was by just watching super sports or watching television and, and watching him fight. I think he had his first fight for Peter then, which was against Bongani Molasi, if I'm not mistaken. And um, 
anyway, follow on maybe a week or two, we meet up with Chris Van Heel and he takes me to meet the Smiths in four ways. And I hit a little bit of pads. And uh, yeah, Peter said, come join me at my gym, be at my gym tomorrow morning at Hoppo Six in London. I said, okay. And the rest is history. So he kind of maybe saw the raw, the raw potential, the raw talent, the strong 18-year-old boy with maybe a little bit of athletic ability, but uh, or maybe he saw nothing and he just saw it as a challenge. Who knows? But that's where it all started. So Chris Van Heeren got me to meet. Obviously, I knew of the Smiths prior to, to that, but I never really got to know them. That was the actual official meeting of Kevin and Peter Smith and the rest of the brothers at the gym. Was there any, any part of boxing that you really struggled with when you initially got into it? That's a good question. If I think back, it was just the understanding of the sport. Um, I was always a physical guy, Sean, so I'm not going to miss my words. I always enjoyed sparring, and I got my ass handed to me multiple, multiple, multiple times in the early part of my career before I turned pro, when I turned pro, by the experienced guys. But what Peter said that stood out for him is I kept coming back. I kept coming back and, and it didn't bother me and I'd never shy out of sparring sessions even though the Tuesday before the Thursday I got obliterated but I stood my ground, I never took a knee, never went down but took my beating like a man in order to learn and I think those are characteristics that Peter always looked for it was I think a lot of heart, balls but the ability to learn and want to learn and be like a sponge who can absorb information. Um, to the beginning of my career it was hard to I wouldn't say click, but it was hard to absorb and understand the sport of boxing because I had no amateur experience. But the physicality side, I understood that very well because of rugby and being the person I am and I'm a winner and I'm somebody who doesn't like to come off second best. So that side of it I understood. But the honing of the skill side and the understanding of the sport and management of yourself in there that's what took time to learn. but And I'm still learning to this day, just fortunate enough to do it as a champion. Mm. Did you did you idolise anyone growing up? Were there any boxers that you looked up to and said, shit, I'd love to be like that guy? My, my, my grandfather always watched a lot of boxing, you know, and uh, he always had uh, posters in his, in his, we call it the playroom, of Joe Louis, Muhammad Ali, Sonny Liston on the wall. But I never really idolised those guys. I always liked and watched from the era of Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield onwards. You know, I was a big fan of Mark Tyson. I was a massive fan of Lennox Lewis. But but back then, I really enjoyed Evander Holyfield. And uh, the way Holyfield's career panned out is kind of similar to how mine had to go. He's going from a smaller guy, cruiserweight, into the heavyweight scene. It's kind of the same thing. So I try to adapt the style. I wouldn't say the style, but the ability to fight with that, <clears throat> that aggression and that spirit and heart that Holyfield possessed. It's a very hard man to beat. But obviously, being me and being who I am, you're never going to be a Holyfield. You're never going to be a Lennox. You're never going to be a Mark. We're all different people with different statures. But I try to take a little bit out of everybody to mold myself and obviously listen to my trainer to make me who I am today. You debuted against Justice Salinga. What was that first fight like? Whew, it was nerve-wracking. I remember that because I haven't had any... Uh, had a couple of street fights and, and, and maybe fights in a nightclub, but that, that doesn't <laughs> compare to... It's going out there to Empress Palace on the 30th of November 2011 in front of people. And now there's this, ex I want to say there's this, people are expecting something, but you always worry. You don't want to let people down. You don't want to let yourself down. You don't want to let your team down. You don't want to bruise your little ego. And then you go out there against Justice Salinga. If my memory serves me correct, I think he had five fights at the time, four wins and two losses, something like that. And uh, he was known as a puncher. His wins came by knockout and he was a big human being. I mean, Justice is not a small guy. I think he weighed in at about 110 and I weighed in at 97. He hit me with one right hand and I was buzzed. I was like, well, shit, this is heavyweight boxing. Here we go. <laughs> and then I managed to weather the storm and, and land the punch of my own, drop him. And I think I dro after that I dropped him the second time, he didn't get up. But it was a wake-up call. What it was a wake-up call, it was something I didn't expect. It was... Nerve wracking. I was so nervous. I was, I, I looked like I handled my nerves well. If I look back, but I know deep down, I was shitting myself because there was so much on the line. But at the end of the day, there was nothing on the line. 
it was just a debut but you know when you believe in yourself and you know what you want to do and, and what you want to achieve it's nerve-wracking but even back then i didn't know what i wanted to do in boxing i wasn't sure if i still wanted to box or if i wanted to be a boxer w- were you working at the time yes three jobs to to keep my head above water um at the time i was working as a sweat 1000 uh, fitness instructor I was training clients on Sean Smith's gym floor and I was bouncing for his brother, George Smith, at Hooters. In, any interesting bouncing stories you want to share? A couple. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't say share. I was, always a, I was always a quiet guy, just trying to do his job, search people at the door. You know, I was never the type of person to, to look for trouble and uh, to try to throw my weight around because I'm also just a young guy. I was 18 years old. You know, people forget that, you know, as much as 18-year-olds think they're the men, deep down they know you're just a boy. <laughs> and uh, I just uh, respected others and respected myself. But uh, when the trouble came, you can ask Georgie, by no means that I back down. <laughs> <laughs> in, in boxing, when did you, as Kevin Arena, know that you had a future in this sport? When did it come home to you that, shit, you know, I can actually make this work? <sighs> when... Um, I trained with Peter the first my first five fights and then uh, I got a whole lot of confusion in my career. I wasn't sure where I wanted to be. I was hasty. And then I left Pete for like one fight and then I came back to Peter. And no, I didn't come back to Peter. I went to the rugby for that moment in time. Then when I came back, I spent a little bit of time with Sean. We had a good run together. I lost to Johnny, my first, the first, my first loss. I think it was my 11th or 10th fight. You make me go back in the archives there, surely, <laughs> but my memory's still okay. I lost to Johnny on points. You know, Johnny was the made it better man on the night. I think it was a, a majority decision, if I'm not mistaken. I was on the back foot the whole night, n- not sure what to do, just uh, showing my resilience and, and toughness because Johnny was bombing Oaks out and I wasn't there to be bombed out. I was just showing how tough I am and how defensive I can be, but without throwing any leather. So I lose that fight and I said, this is a shit place to be. I don't like this. I don't like losing. But I, there's something that I'm missing here. There's something that's, that's not with me. And I said to myself, you know what? Peter, will you take me back? Will you take me back as a fighter? Because my first five fights I was with you, we had a great run. Yes, my first five fights went against Johnny Miller-like opponents. But we had a great run and you understood me. We had a very unique bond that very few trainers and fighters will have. Cut a long story short, Peter took me back under his wing. And I'll say to Rodney, and we speak about it to this day, when Peter went to Rodney and he said to Rod, I'm training Kevin now. Can you give us some opportunity? Rod said to Peter, do you think he's going to make it? I don't, I don't think so. And, and, and this is no disrespect to Rod because we talk about it because he admits to saying he was wrong. And Peter said, just give him a chance. Just give him a chance, Rodney. And I thank Rodney for this because he gave me that chance. He brought me to Denmark to have a four-round or a six-round fight just to get back to winning ways. I got that victory. And then I fought Dion Kutsia for the SA title. And uh, obviously I won every round against Dion. Hurt him, I would say, obliterated him in a fight that himself and his trainer Nick didn't think I could win. I beat Dion and I beat him well. And uh, that's when I said, you know what, I can do this sport. I really, really can do the sport if I pay attention, if I work hard and I discipline and dedicate myself to the ground. And I listened to instructions because I knew I always had the athletic ability. I was strong enough. It was just about clicking and listening and, and, and understanding the sport of boxing. N- the late Nick Durant messaged me the next day. I just want to say, well done. Well done on your victory. You had a a tremendous fight you surprised me and that's a message that sticks with me to this day because nick durant was a legend trainer and i always tell his son damien that's what your dad told me after i bought uh, after i beat dion and and damien said that was one of your best performances and that was a turning point for me in my career i mean if you look at the record from there on it was onwards and upwards it was the upward trajectory and it was that moment when i said i can do this sport but i need to listen to peter i need to cut all the bullshit out you ignore the noise, focus on me, ignore the naysayers, focus what I, on what I need to do, and then the rest is history. If I look back, that was the turning point in my career because on came the, the second fight with Miller. Mm. That was a victory. Then the that was your next fight eh? yes. against Johnny. You avenged it. Yes, and then the Super 4, 
And there was the top 10 cruiserweight ratings and, yeah. then, and so on and so forth, the Kalinga, you know, and then to this point today. But I learned a lot over those years, but I applied myself, Sean. I, it was that moment in 2015, I think I beat Dion in 2015, which was the turnaround for me. 2015 was the point where I said, I can do this and I can do it really well. And I do it and I owe it to the people who believe in me, Rodney, Peter, and all my supporters and family. I said, and I'm going to do it. I enjoy boxing. I love it now. And I want to become a world champion. Your first fight was on the Golden Gloves bill. Mm -hmm. You went away for one or two fights to do your own thing. You came back. You and Rodney have got a long-standing relationship. Yes. You know, I wouldn't say I did my own thing. It was about just staying busy. Um, Rodney gave me the opportunity. I had my debut with Golden Gloves or African Ring at the time, that Christmas Cracker, then a Golden Gloves show, then another Golden Gloves show. And then... Uh, I went two or three or four shows without Golden Gloves because I, I didn't want to stay inactive. So I fought at Turfentine Racecourse. I fought at DF Milan School. I Heartfelt fought at Arena. Heartfelt Arena. I fought yeah. wherever I could fight just to get fights. Yeah. And um, But if you look at the majority of my career, it was backed by Rodney Berman. You know, he saw he saw the star in the making or a potential star. And um, Peter obviously always knew what I could do and, and what he needed to do for me to to get there, but Rodney has given me a whole heap of opportunities. But in return, obviously, I've given him a whole heap of entertainment too. Mm. You you won the RBO Cruiserweight title. You defended it six times. You had a fight at Bridger. You went too heavy. You back to Bridger. Mm. Looking back now, do you, do you think you maybe could have or should have stayed in the cruiser and just carried on grinding in that division? No, by no means. Uh, I won the Cruiserweight World title at 24 years old. And... Um, my body structure changed, it evolved, and it was very hard to make the weight, Sean. You know, even my last three cruiserweight fights, it was a challenge, but I made it, but it, it was not easy. It was not easy at all. So I outgrew the division, and in a way I'm somewhat happy because the cruiserweight names, if you look at the cruiserweight division over the last five years, there's not much happening. It's a stagnant division, I mean, the same guys are fighting for the same eliminators, the same belts, you know. There's there's been solid champions at Cruiserweight. You mean your Lunga Makabu defended his WBC a couple of times. You had your Neil Dortikas, you had Usak who's gone up to heavyweight. I mean, you had Gassiv, you had Bradis, but now you got a new a new bunch of guys and they're good fighters, but it doesn't appeal to me. You know, the glamour division is the bigger guys, and I don't think Cruiserweight got the light it deserved. It had its, its moment, but I think the division remained very stagnant, especially the past three or four years, just before COVID, during COVID, and, and a little bit after. You know, on the bridge weight, mm. only the WBC recognizes the bridge weight, yes. which I think is a good thing, because I think the gap between cruiser and heavy, top heavy, mm. is too big. Yeah. Do you think it's going to take off like cruiser did back in the day? It all depends who fights for the belt. Mm. I think... Uh, the value of the belt is who fights for it. Um, it can take off. There's, there's potential for it. Um, do you need buy-in from other organizations? Most definitely it will add a bit of weight, but the WBC, the green and gold, is probably one of the best belts in the division and the belts that, one of the, that fighters want to hold. Um, it's a good way for me. It was a good way for me to return after my loss against Daniel Dubois because I got good fights against a Murray, against the, the Skashi. But if you look at my heavyweight ranking, I think I'm, I'm number 12 or number 11 in the world now on Boxrec when I last looked. So for me... 15. That, yes, 15. Mm. So for me, that's important because I'm there for any of those top 15 guys. When the offer comes, Rodney is well aware, Pete's well aware. If it's a good enough offer, it's a belt, it's a lucrative fight, I'll take it. You know, I'm by no means done with heavyweight. I'm a very small heavyweight, we know that, but I know what I can do at heavyweight. And people know what can happen at heavyweight. Mm. If you get caught, you find yourself on your ass. You catch them, they're on their ass. So it's, a, it's about navigating it right, but the big paydays are at heavyweight. And at the end of the day, I started the sport because I love it, and I still do love it, but I want to do well. And I want to be that South African fighter carrying the flag on the biggest stage, and trying my best to earn the biggest money. That's Big, what it's all about. Biggest fight you had, 
Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, Daniel Dubois. You were with us. Yeah, there. it was an amazing experience. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it was, was unbelievable. Cool. And Do, it was looking back at Daniel now, yeah. he went on to fight Usak and then Miller. For the Usak fight, he got something like 38 million rand. Yes. Do you, th do you sit there and, and watch it and think, Shit, that could have been me? It should have been me. Hmm. I don't sit there. I, I cuss when I watch the TV. I said, you know, it, it is what it is. I was meant to be fighting Usak for two million pounds. But it wasn't, that wasn't what happened for me. It, it mm. wasn't meant to be, maybe. Um, he got a big fight against Jerome Miller and he fought very well, probably the best fight I've seen of his. Mm. So I commend him. Well done to him. He, he fought really well. He showed no quit in him. He dug down deep. Jerome Miller isn't a Alexander Usyk. He's not a Kevin Lorena, but he's a very big man. So you got to respect the boy for that. He dug deep. But he's got that opportunity. He took it with open arms. Look, he got caught against Usyk. Did he quit against Usyk? I don't know. Let the fans decide that. I don't. I don't. I don't really want to knock people. Mm. But uh, he's come back and he came back very well. And uh, he's on that upward trajectory now. He obviously wants a big heavyweight world title fight. I've been calling for the rematch for a long time. It's just. Uh, it's not that I can't sleep at night. I think it's due to me. Mm. You know, we both know that he doesn't know what hit him in round one. Thanks. He said, what did you hit me with, you know, after the fight? So it was a legitimate knockdown where anything could have happened and then I got caught. So it was a backwards and forwards fight for whilst it lasted. But um, good luck to Daniel Dubois. That was a surreal moment in my career. If you look back at that record from where I started to where I went to, it's surreal. Mm. I was co-main event Tottenham Hotspur Stadium to Tyson Fury and Chisora against Daniel Dubois. 2011, I was at Empress Palace on the Christmas cracker. So I'm proud. I'm very proud. As you should be. And I had you there too. So <laughs> that was a good experience. You know, having you there and having you document a lot, we're going we're gonna to share some valuable stories one day when you come out with something that I know. <laughs> I look forward to it. Um, if, you had, if you had to have a fight now and they said to you, Howard Foster was your referee, what, what goes through your mind? <laughs> what I would say is, well, if that's who it is, it's okay. I'll talk to him before the fight and I'll say, look, you are the man in charge. I respect that. When and if a man is hurt, give him every right to recover. Give him every right to fight. If he cannot do that and you see injury happening, by all means, stop the fight. But don't stop a man who's got a full minute to recover. That's bullshit. That's yeah. all I'd say. But, you know, he's a, he's a well-known ref. Um, I'd say he's had some shady calls. I mean, it's not obvious. A lot of people have said he stopped fights way too soon. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's his style of refereeing. Would I want them to change the ref? Most definitely, I'd say uh, choose someone else, please. But that's his style of refereeing. He's the man in charge, and I respect that. On a personal level, mm. you paramedic. You got a, a, a thing for guns. <laughs> yeah. You fly helicopters, crash some of them too. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a bit more about Kevin Lorena outside of the ring. An adrenaline junkie, a guy who likes to test himself, you know, put myself, find myself in difficult situations and I, I like to work my way out of them. You know, being involved in paramedicine is something that I've always enjoyed and, and, and had a passion for and that's why I went and got the qualification so I can treat people out in the road and in the combat environment. So that's where I got the qualification. I kind of like, I wouldn't say transferred it, but I amalgamated the tactical side with it to become a combat medic. And that adds a bit of action and adrenaline to the saving of lives. Um, I always had a passion. I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, I went to NAC Aviation School. It took me six months to do my license and get my license. I got my license. Um, flown my family all over the country. And then I uh, had an unfortunate incident. It was a training incident. We we're doing a training uh, simulation, simulating a tail rotor failure. And we got a right skid low. The right skid hooked in the helicopter and we did a dynamic rollover. So accidents do happen, but it shows you how the margin of error is just so small. Mm. And um, yeah, listen, accidents do happen. They shouldn't happen, but they do happen. But um, I learned a lot from that too. It's about growing in life, you know. If you get that opportunity or that second chance, you need to learn and you need to grow. Uh, being knocked down and getting back up again, as cliche as it sounds, it's so true. Mm. In whatever walks of life you're looking at, it's so true. Boxing the business world, being a medic, being a pilot, whatever it is, life's going to throw some things at you and, what, and it's how you deal with it that 
that makes you the man you are in the moment. And the moment is now. Talk about business. Mm. Most boxers or a lot of boxers find themselves in financial trouble when, once they stop or retire. Mm. Are you going to be okay? I hope so. Um, I'd like to say I've networked enough to know what I know in the security industry, in the EMS industry, in life itself. And uh, I have a few ideas of what I want to do when I finish the sport of boxing. And uh, I don't want to have any debt when I finish the sport of boxing. I want to make sure my houses are all paid off. I want to make sure I have no debts with cars. I'm the type of person I, I wouldn't say I waste money. I really don't. So I'd like to say I live within my means and uh, I want to never be that person who's struggling. But, you know, life, you don't know what life has to hold, you know. If you're an opportunity or a go-getter like me, you're going to throw money at things and hope they work for you. So, but I would by no means say I'm careless. I'm not like that. I wouldn't say I'm thrifty, but I'd say that, you know, I I know what, what it's like to have money. I would know what it's like not to have money. And I know what financial freedom can do for you and yourself as a family, you know, and your children and... um I just want to be comfortable and, and be a dad that my kids are able to go to school, they go to a decent school, they go through school with manners, they learn the right things. I just want to be that person because when it's all said and done, you can't take anything with you to the grave. You leave it behind for other people, your children, your wife, your family, but uh, manners and respect and life lessons are for free. And that's what I want to teach. Yeah, you, you talk about your support. You've got a very good wife standing behind you with her head screwed on straight. Yes. How important is family to you? Very important. I think um, it's the most important thing because if I look at, I wouldn't say other fighters, but other athletes who they're all over the show because they, 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 they not, I wouldn't say their families are uprooted, but they're not sure what they want and they're here, they're there, they're seeking this, they're seeking that. Mm. I'm not seeking anything in life. I'm focused on my grind. I got my wife, I got my children, and I know what I want to do to be successful and further successful. I'm a go-getter, but I'm a go-getter with a good support structure, and I come home to a house that is there for me, you know. Yes, I provide. Yes, I've done all I can to to give my kids a good life, and their mother too, Gina, my, my ex-wife's done all she can to give our kids a good life. But we also know that that can be swept from underneath you very quickly and you've got to live in the moment. So I'd, I'd say 2023 was a big year for me to say, dedicate a lot of my time to my children, dedicate a lot of my time to my wife and to grow with them, you know, and then that gave me great success in boxing because it was going to the gym, training, coming home, spending time with the family and repeat, repeat, repeat. I wasn't as much on the road. I wasn't as much on the tactical jobs and all those kind of things. I was... I wouldn't say I wasn't focused on my boxing before, but I just said, you know, I'm going to take some time away from boxing and spend it with my family. And when I'm not with my family, I'm in the boxing gym. So, and that paid off for me this year. But it's, I'm a person, I, I can't sit still at home, Sean. I can't. I'm, <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm ADD, but I'm, I'm on the go. I cannot, uh, I'm not a couch potato. I'm not a Netflix kind of guy. I like to do things. I like to move around. I like to stay busy. And Geraldine knows that. She says, she always tells everybody, my husband can never sit at home. If you see him on the couch for an hour, it's an hour too long. Because I need to do something. I need to be active. I need to either be doing something, doing business, doing something. You know, if I'm not training, I must be doing something. And I guess that's a personality trait that's that's aided me in my success today. Coming back to boxing, mm. you've got a big year ahead of you. Uh, I get the feeling that 2024 is going to be the year that either makes Kevin Lorena, world champion, or doesn't? Hmm. Um, is, is that the sense you get now where you are with your career? Yes, I've got another four strong, solid years left. I'm in my peak right now. I'm the strongest I've been. I believe my boxing IQ is the highest it's been in my whole career. Now it's up to me to make it happen. You know, the boxing is a very hard sport where the highs are there and the lows are there. I mean, you know it, you've seen it. And uh, we're on the upward trajectory right now, you know. I think what people don't realize when you come back from a loss and you and you pick up your two solid wins immediately after that, it's very important for your confidence, for yourself, for your emotional well-being and for your team. Mm. So now it's up to me to go on and deliver what's left. Um, who knows what's left? 
I've always said I wanted to fight for the heavyweight championship of the world at the highest level, and I truly believe I will do that. There's, there's a bit of a shake-up now in the heavyweight division. Huh? A bit of the old guard seems to be like Deontay Wilder's recent loss. Yeah. There seems to be a bit of a shake-up. It would be nice to be part of that. I want to be part of it, and I mm. believe I will be part of that, you know, with uh, my team, with Peter's training style, with uh, Rodney Berman and his connections abroad. We can get these opportunities, you know, the big boys. It's all about watching the big boys and the heavyweights, and, and that's where I am, and that's where I've always wanted to be. And that alone is a victory and an achievement on its own. But now it's about capitalizing and being more than just an achievement. I want to be the person to shock the world. And I believe I can. Um, it's never going to be easy. The heavyweights are strong fighters. They're all good fighters. You can't uh, undermine any of them, but it's just about opportunity. So I know if I get given the second opportunity at a big fight, I need to now take it. And I mm. think 2024 is the year for that. You know, I must take care of business against either Badu Jack or Rosinski. That I need to focus on. But if that fight doesn't materialize and a big heavyweight fight does, as Peter and Rodney said, we'll take that too. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about uh, financial freedom and uh, looking after my, the family. my well-being and the family. You know, and the family is a big family. You know, we've got Peter's family, we've got Rodney's family. We need to all look after one another. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. You know, Rodney needs to see a bit of uh, ROI on me and... Uh, you only see that at the heavyweight game, the big boys, and, and Peter and you see, well, he's seen the ROI with me, but we need to grow as a team. You know, mm -hmm. we need to we need to enrich one another. You know, when, when Peter wins, I win. When I win, Peter wins. And we're talking financially, we're talking emotionally, we're talking as a gym. I'd say for a very long time, I've been been carrying the Smith's flag very high, and I'm proud of that. Bridgeweight division, mm. you've mentioned who you'd like to fight next year. If it, if it materializes that you have a heavyweight fight, anyone you eyeing? I see Murat Gassiz in the top 10 there. I'd really like that fight. He's a big puncher. I think uh, a style that would suit me. But there's a lot of names there. I mean, Otto Wallen, he's just lost to AJ, but he's a southpaw. He's a heavyweight. I see I, I, see I, I can beat him. There's Daniel Dubois. There's, um, do you think you've got the beating of Daniel? Yes, I do, if I don't get hit. Any heavyweight or any fighter gets hit by Daniel will have a hard time. Mm. He really punches hard. I mean, it's it's obvious, you know. There's a reason why he knocked out Anthony Joshua in sparring. He's dropped many fighters in sparring because he's a massive puncher. So I think if you can avoid that big punch and, and, and boxing and, and hurt him and put him on the back foot, you got a chance to beat Daniel Dubois. If you're going to sit in the pocket like I did and make the mistake like I did, it will be a very hard, a very long night. Who wins, Fury or Usak? <sighs> That's a hard question, Sean, because based on Tyson Fury's last fight, he didn't fight well, but you also got to look at the quality of opponents. Francis Ngannou is a former UFC heavyweight world champion, but he's not a boxer. But those kind of guys to fight are awkward because you don't know what they're going to throw or where they're going to come from. Usyk's a conventional fighter, like a cat in the ring. He's in, he's out, he's up, he's down, he's all over, he's left, he's right. Fury, on Fury's last performance, I'm leaning towards Usyk. I really am. But Tyson Fury's a beast. He's got big match temperament. We've seen it when he fought Deontay Wilder. We've seen it when he fought Vladimir Klitschko. Tyson Fury's a phenomenal fighter. And so is Alexander Usyk. So if I had to stick my neck out... That's probably the hardest question of this podcast, but I'm going to I'm gonna lean towards the bigger man. I think I think Fury can beat him if if he uses his solid jab, if he's able to keep Usyk at bay. But if he lets Usyk on the inside and, and, and shows Usyk too much respect, I think Usyk will outpoint him. He won't knock him out, but he'll most definitely outpoint him. Not that anyone cares, but I think Usyk beats him on work rate alone. No, we can. It's a valid point. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. If he allows him, if he shows him respect and allows him in, it's going to be a long night for Fury. The mm. only way you beat Usyk is if you back him up. Dubois kind of tried to back him up. AJ had moments in his fights of backing him up and hitting him to his body. Martin Bacoli has dropped Usyk to his body. He's very vulnerable to the body, but to get to that body is another story because he's such a good mover. So if Fury can establish a good jab, and work behind that jab, it will be hard for Usyk. But if he allows Usyk in and to dictate the pace, it will be a long night for Tyson Fury. But that's a very good fight, and and and, and it's for the undisputed eh? mm. heavyweight championship of the world. So 
but I'm going to go with Fury, I think. You mentioned Martin Bacoli. You, mm. sp- you sparred with him. Yes. World champion potential? Most definitely. Most avoided fighter in the division. He also battered Daniel Dubois up in sparring. He's given Anthony Joshua a hard time. He's dropped Usyk. I mean, it's public knowledge. He's a beast. You know, he's come he's come about himself since his loss with Michael Hunter. I mean, he beat Tony Yoka. He destroyed Carlos Takam. So he's he's shouting and he's shouting loud in the division. He's definitely one of the most avoided fighters and I had the privilege of sparring him and uh, learning a lot from him. He's a big man. He's a strong guy too. Um, can he become heavyweight world champion? Given the opportunity, most definitely. Kevin, thank you for your time. Sure, no. It was great chatting to you and I'm sure we'll chat to you after you get the WBC title. Yes, or after we fight another massive heavyweight fight because I know you'll be coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Sean.